going to be recording this, even though it's not going to actually show up on the recording, but then at least you'll be able to hear me talking about it. So uh, this is the DIC uh, load displacement data without the hole, or with, with the hole, sorry. Um, so this is the specimen inside the grips. One of the first things off the bat we noticed uh, was that the strain to failure is very, very high and that the modulus here is very low relative to what you would expect for a tensile specimen. So um, I didn't realize it would be so far off, but this is, if you remember for the tension lab way back when, uh, we had given you clip gauges on the axial and transverse uh, gauge, parts of the gauge section. There's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that these things slip in the grips. So actually DIC is uh, is a useful technique for this because you can actually, you could draw a marker here and draw a marker there and actually digitally track the displacement of the sample. So you could get a virtual clip gauge effectively. Um, but this also means that the displacement data here, this, uh, this wherever it is, the strain data here that we're getting uh, and these large strains to failure are not real or not correct because of that slipping of the specimen in the gauge, in the, in the grips. So if you look at the specimen, if you were to have looked at the specimen afterward, so these grips are, are these little triangular pyramid things that uh, get smashed into the sample, you would have noticed there was a, instead of being a triangular pyramid, it would have been a groove. And that groove is because that grip was slipping. And so all of that slipping, all of that displacement is what's giving rise to this um, larger strain. But, uh, what we can say is that the the strain, the, the, the stress is the real stress. There, so there's, there's only a sample in the middle. So the stress that it is measuring is correct. And we, what we can do is use that to get a rough ballpark of what strain we should see in the far field of the sample. So here, if I were to, so if I were to apply 131 MPA of stress, which is somewhere, I don't know, here-ish, yeah there -ish, so like right at the start of the plastic zone, I would expect to see about 0.2% strain. So now that happens at a strain, at a time of 36 seconds. So if I pull back um, now to the DIC plot, 36 seconds would be 13 seconds, which I can pull forward to here, somewhere around there. Um, and I doubt, can any, any of you actually see the scale bar here on the side, the numbers there? Yeah, like barely. So, so the far field stress you see is, is noisy. So DIC is a, is a noisy method, uh, but you see it's pink, white-ish, which correlates to around 0.1 to 0.2, uh, maybe 0.3, depending. So that 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 actually matches up well with what we would expect here. And this, uh, what we're expecting here, why, why are these numbers not, okay. So what I'm using to calculate these numbers is the applied stress on the specimen equals that divided by the Young's modulus uh, B6. So I'm getting 12% stress there. Uh, and then here, 19%. I don't know why that equation went away. That was weird. Um, so here, that like 0.19-ish that we were expecting, we do see in the far field. So that means the applied stress on the sample is actually matching up with the strain that we're seeing axially in the far field. The stress, however, now is, or the, the strain, not the stress, the, the strain at the hole, at the, at the edge of the hole is where a lot of that error prediction, where a lot of that error is coming in. So uh, I'm gonna point you to this. So here, we're at that, the start of the plastic yield point for the specimen. So that means the whole gauge specimen of the, of the sample is starting to plastically deform. But that means the stress at the edge of the crack, or at the edge of the hole, is three times-ish what the stress in the body is. Uh, different because of the boundary conditions, but somewhere around that order. So if we were to rewind and look at the stress at a very low stress point, uh, let's say around there like eight seconds. Here, the, the far field stress is so lost in the noise that you can't even tell what it is. Like there's a negative here and a positive here. So like the far field stress is just nonsense because the, the noise and the DIC measurement is there. Um, but say, so this is at 
eight seconds at that, or eight seconds is 24 seconds, so we're at an applied stress of 84 MPA. We expect around 12.12% strain, which means here we would expect something like 0.3% strain, 0.36% strain at the tip of the hole, which is sort of what we see. This is like a 0 0.25, 0 0.3 at the edge of that hole now. Um, so in the elastic regime, you would see that 3%. But now as, we're, as we get into higher strains, basically this region immediately starts plastically deforming. So you see now this is at nine seconds. Um, this, is, this max is 0.45 at the next step. This is 0.75. At the step after that, this is 1.1. So it's just kind of ramping up very, very quickly, much higher than the far field applied strain is. And that's because here we have plastic deformation localizing. So if you can capture the strain at one of these low points, so say like one of these, one of these points closer to, um, closer in the elastic region, there still will have been plastic deformation around your specimen, around the whole of the specimen but the stress won't be as crazy. Um, but when you actually see that strain contour, the correct strain contour start to pop up, it's already well plastically deformed, which is part of what we wanted you to, to see and understand in the lab, um, which is why I was hoping at, so at now large applied strains, these strains are insane. This is 13 or 14% strain, which is, I mean, that's very, very highly deformed and eventually that a crack forms in the specimen and we get 32, yeah, there we go. So you, you, so you can actually see it, it's, it's hard to tell because the scale bar is getting adjusted so fast, but here in this step, this is 13% strain, 13, then 16, then 20, then 32. So clearly something very drastic is happening right there. And so that's, that's the crack actually forming with the DIC uh, it, the, the crack that you can see forming in DIC. Um, so the other, so that's that's one of the biggest sources of where all of this error is coming from. So we would expect large error. Ignore the fact that this data is nonsense. You should still be able to correlate the far field approximately with the applied stress. Um, the reason that we have you then take the specimen without the hole. So this now. There we go. So this is the specimen without the hole, is this gives you a baseline for how much noise you should have. So you see, let's go up to that 13 seconds. It was just gonna be about the same applied stress. Uh, you can see the average stress here, ah, let's say it's like 0.3% strain, um, but then this max is 0.5 and this min is 0.1. So you already have basically a quarter of a percent error in your DIC noise. And so that quarter of a percent error is what we want you to use as your, as your theoretical bound. So then say if you're experimental, if, if, you, if you are picking a point somewhere on here and you say, well, my, the, the strain that I'm measuring is 0.1% um, and the experimental is supposed to be zero. So my error is infinity. Um, that's not what we're hoping to have you take away. The, the point is that if, you're, if your measurement is 0.1 and your error on top of that is 0.25, then you're within the error bound for your measurement, which is, it's unfortunate that this uh, particular method was giving such a high error, um, but that's kind of the way it is. Wait, can you explain again how you got that 0.25 error bound? So here, uh, you can barely see the scale bar, but this is kind of, so like somewhere in the average of the specimen, we'll say this is like a 0.3% strain here, which I don't know if you can actually read it because it's a super tiny scale bar, but trust me that that's a 0.3. Here, uh, the maximum that we're seeing, uh, we'll say is like conservatively 0.5. So that means, or let, let's be even more conservative and say 0.55. So at the very edge of the specimen, we're seeing 0.55 there. That means my average is 0.3 plus 0.25. Then the bottom is 0.05 which is again very conservative because that's at the very extremities, but that means it's 0.3 plus or minus 0.25. So plus or minus a quarter percent error. So that's what you're gonna apply as your bounds on the first applied stress, right? And you would move towards those applied stress. 
for whichever so so any any axial transverse or shear measurement you take you can correlate with the whole specimen without the hole at that same applied strain and use that as an approximate error bound so like at higher applied strain we might have higher or lower error uh, oh this is already plastically deforming oh you can see shear bands starting to form that's cool I wasn't actually expecting that these are looters bands that's a thing uh, that I'm not going to tell you about other than that it's a thing but um, so for example here now I don't know let's let's say I was I was at this really high applied strain um, now this applied strain oh that's huge uh, this is say somewhere 0.26 uh, and then 3.3 is the highest and 2.1 is the lowest so now I have a 0.6 percent error which isn't actually correct because this is so these these bands that are forming are real uh, and it's, it's called the looters band it's just part of how materials are formed and I'm happy to talk about it later if anyone's interested but so um, these are error bounds that you would apply to your experimental values yes to compare against your theoretical values so you say my experimental values are this I predict this exper I predict this theoretically but then that's within the noise or the error of my DIC measurement and you can get that bound based on the specimen without the hole which is why we have you look at a specimen without a so hole So you, I guess you, you can calculate a theoretical error, but then you could say um, if it's within the bound of your error, then infinite error doesn't quite make sense. I guess we, we're having you, so, so you're reporting some of those values in a table, right? So you have like experimental, theoretical, and then error uh, for those three. Uh, oh, so like if you're theoretical with zero, and you're actually measuring Maybe I I don't know what and then you, you should like list there. Yeah, it's it's infinity star star being that you're with actually within the error bounds. Okay. Yeah, just just some note showing that you understand that it's that it's in the error bounds. Um, I don't know what the best way to report that is. Yeah. Could you say again how you're um, taking frame by frame like? Because that's obviously time scale isn't going to be how you pick which frame to compare. So it's just the total stress that you're using. You know what I'm saying? For, for comparing the metal with the whole versus the whole metal. Uh, yeah, you would you would compare it at the same applied stress. So you would so you would have to get it like uh, you'd have to figure out approximately what frame matched up with what stress, uh, and then so like the to figure out to figure it out for the whole you just uh, the specimen with the hole, you just take whatever time step it's at, and then it's three times that, and you figure out what line in there has three times the time. But on the other one, you would say, okay, this is 131. <coughs> Let me go back to the to the other Excel sheet for the one without the hole, figure out what time that's at, and then find the video frame that corresponds with that. So you're going the backwards way. Yeah. So um, earlier when you were calculating the theoretical strain at the far field, uh, when you're using the applied stress to so you should still use the same Young's modulus. You should still use the same material properties. Um, and then you can use that. So, so here I'm taking that Young's modulus of 70 gigapascals uh, and dividing the, the applied stress at that point by that to get the theoretical strain. Does that give you the same value as if, if you use like the equations from that code? Yeah, it should. So the the far field should be approximately the same as the one without the hole. So like, there's the strain and stress concentration at the hole, but then far away from the hole, that stress concentration doesn't exist. So it should be the same as if you were just pulling on a uniform specimen. Because I was using the um, 
maybe this is just a mistake I made somewhere, but like oh, when I was using the code and I tried using like an R value of like 25 millimeters, say, and then like theta equals zero, so that would correspond to like there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I got like an order of magnitude off of what I expected. Like it's it's like yeah, there's two times ten to the negative third instead of point two times ten to the negative third, which is what I would expect. It's like an mm -hmm. order of magnitude off. I was trying to figure out why. I, I think I just. So I did a 220% error. So. Uh, I, I, I have to yeah. look. <laughs> That's my highest one. Like, I couldn't figure out why that was. And I was trying to look through the code. Like, but I'm not sure what's going on. I can show you later. Yeah. <laughs> and the plots ref reflect that too. The plots that I produced from the code. Like it says in the far field that it expects it to be about 2 times 10 to the eighth. Yeah. Which is not right, I don't think, according to what you're saying here. So. Yeah, that is strange. So, so the as a as a ballpark estimate for far field, it should just be stress over modulus. Yeah, and that, that makes sense to and me. It's just when I use the equation. Was, was it an was it an order of magnitude off of that? Yeah. Oh. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it gave me a two times ten to the negative one. It's supposed to be around. Which is what the DIC uh, is showing me. So. Yeah, come show me later. Okay. That's and this is from the. Yeah, maybe it's something in my code. But I did hand calculations. Yeah, I'm, I have the same like over 100 percent order of magnitude problem. Yeah, that's so what we were saying yesterday. If you divide one by 100 and multiply the other one by 100, you're you're closer in your errors. <laughs> But that's not how you science. <laughs> I just, be, I just forgot a fact. I forgot a factor of 100 somewhere. It's okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like the, the equations, like they work fine for like around the hole. Mm -hmm. like, so you know how we were supposed to choose point 0.1 right above the hole, point 0.2 way up, yeah. point 0.3 to the right, point 0.4 down here. Point 0.1 it worked fine, point 0.3 it worked fine, point 0.2 it was really that's that's really weird because point two should be and the. I use the exact same equation, like, and I just changed the inputs. Yeah, swing by. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow. Um, yeah, I, I, could I just might. I may need to. Show you really right after class yeah, that will also work. Okay. Was there a reason why? The far field strings recorded in the Excel data would be greater than the range of strings in the DIC data at the same time. Uh, say that again. So, like in my DIC data, you have a range of strain on the side. Um, you convert to the cell time, and then finding the same strain, I showed you that line was greater. Like the strain in my Excel data at that point. Is greater than like this, the range oh, of strings. right, right, right. Yeah. So that's that's because of this, because the that strain, the the far field strain that you're getting here isn't right because the thing is slipping. So even though so this this strain from the load displacement data, just take this to basically you're looking to see where the yield point is and that specimen with the hole and without the hole don't change much, but the actual value of strain doesn't make sense <laughs> because we are, we weren't using a clip gauge. So like this is this is the failure strain of this is like one point three percent strain, but that's not that's really high. Like it it should be like half a percent strain. Is that the only explanation for it? Yeah. There I don't know, there might be other stuff, but that's likely the biggest cause of that discrepancy. So for for predicting what your far field strain should be, just take the applied stress divided by the the modulus. Yeah. Were you saying earlier to not use the Young's modulus that we found fitting? No, yeah. Because that one does, that's not a correct measurement because of the slipping in the grips. So use, use the modulus of aluminum, so 69 or 70 gigapascals. That's well. So, so this measurement shouldn't matter. Like, like this data, the, the strain column shouldn't matter for any of the DIC calculations. Okay. Like, you sh you should be using the applied stress, and the applied stress is 
correct because there's even if it slips the stress is still the stress but then the strain you you should be calculating from those equations using the applied stress and so even using the like theoretically done modulus it should still report similar values in far field strains yes it should the yeah and that order of magnitude now is very confusing and i should take a look at some of the codes you guys are using. So then what sorts of percent errors should these be expected? So Praveen is going to go through all of the analysis again and sometime this afternoon let you know ballpark what percentages error what percentages of error you should be expecting. Yeah. So we talked about this last night um, and that's why <laughs> this morning was a little bit quick of a turnaround but by the afternoon he should have something. So for those of us that were So I'm sure some of it will still carry over. The, the big thing is that you're thinking through the sources of error and trying to explain them. So like the noise in the DIC. The, so one thing that I, that I didn't mention. Um, so around the hole, we should, I think, be getting a negative strain there. The way DIC works, that, that interpolation, so it creates a, a pixel subset and is interpolating that around. Anytime there's a boundary, it can't interpolate into the boundary because there's nothing to interpolate across. So that uh, around a, a boundary, there's going to be inherently some extra noise um, or some extra error in the DAC measurement. Um, but you don't have to completely rewrite your discussion. But do if there's some of this that you hadn't thought through before, try to incorporate it. So like, um, just to know what we should expect theoretically, on the top, like the top and bottom edges of this hole, it should just go from like zero absence. I think so. Because like if if the stress concentration right. on these two sides is this way, uh, and then the stress concentration on this top side is in the transverse direction, there should no be no axial. Yes. Straight down yeah, yeah. In that direction. So at that point, it should just go from zero yep. to your far field. Yeah, because there's a free boundary there, so there can't be any, there can't be any axial stress here or axial strain at at the very very edge of the hole. But then, as to how far that zero extends, that's different problem. But so, if we could get like a, a hundred percent accurate resolution all the way up to the edge of the hole, you would see a zero there. Yeah, yeah. It's just like like I, I was thinking about that yesterday. It should go from like that zero value up to whatever your far field value is, and that's what a theoretical plot seems to produce, which makes sense. Yeah. But the theoretical goes from like zero to the value of like that's an order of magnitude bigger than what's there. And so right. I just don't know why that's happening. Yeah. I'll, I'll okay. take a look at the code after class. Uh, so when I was choosing the points for where I would like take the apply stress one in the small strain region. It was still like pretty noisy data, so I did on the upper end of that. And now you said like the strains are all offset because of the slipping. Uh, should I should that just be mentioned in like the uh, discussion that like it's still in the like you can see on my graph it's right around the yield point mm -hmm. where you think like the somewhere around here the one point five percent stress is yeah like yeah. Right there. Uh, so, so this still, the videos were still pretty noisy. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. So so the big thing to mention here is that there is plastic. So so the, the goal was here. There's a lot of plastic deformation. So clearly the results are going to be different. Close or in the elastic region, there should be less plastic deformation. So the results should be closer. But as long as you're talking about the fact that there is, that's that's the important point. The the actual value of the strain here doesn't matter for your calculation. It's just the applied stress, like. The, but the, what I don't want you to be confused with is the strain here is like 1.36. The actual strain in the, the far field sample should be about 0.2. Right, it's comparing the points. Not yeah, the but, we, but you're not using this strain value anywhere in the calculations. Yeah. Yeah, or, yeah hopefully not. <laughs> cool. Other questions on things? Maybe. Probably lots.
Okay. Uh, there's more TA office hours and my office hours this week, um, and I'm happy to keep talking through some of these things. Okay. Um, let's talk about fracture for like, or fatigue for like 10 minutes, and then I'll give you guys the end of the quarter review thing. So, cool. So fatigue. Yesterday we had talked about, so the way that we characterize fatigue as in an engineering sense is using an SN curve. Uh, so this is N F, so number of number of cycles to failure. Cycles to failure. Generally, this is plotted as a log plot, um, and then the stress amplitude. We had some high fatigue range, or some uh, low cycle fatigue, high cycle fatigue, and then generally some endurance limit here. Uh, so this is when, ah, so I, I figured out where my, where my error was with this yesterday, where my misunderstanding was. So here, this is the, the stress amplitude at failure. If now we have a plot with a mean stress that's zero, uh, so now here, this is my stress amplitude, this is my my mean stress, there we go, stress amplitude, mean stress. Uh, here, if I were to plot this graph out for a mean stress of zero, then my stress amplitude would be my ultimate stress. So if, if this were a mean of zero, uh, and then this uh, low cycle, low cycle, it's like, uh, is when we're deforming the material plastically. This high cycle, we're deforming our material elastically. And at some endurance limit, the mechanical properties of the material don't degrade anymore. Yeah? So the last lecture you said that that stress is the yield stress. Like it's actually supposed to be yeah, it should have been the ultimate, sorry. Um, and that it is the ultimate if I have a mean stress of zero and then my amplitude would be the, the ultimate strength of the material um, in tension. Yeah, so this, this point would change if it wasn't zero, but you would get a similar type of, or similar looking plot for SN. Um, so then there was some relationship now if we plotted this in a log log space so if this is now log of SA versus log of number of cycles to failure we have some um, relationship here where the slope uh, of this line is B and I can say that the stress amplitude relates to the number of cycles to failure by some constant times number of cycles to failure to some exponent. So this is um, how we generally quantify uh, the, the decay due to fatigue, the decay in material properties due to fatigue. So if I have a certain amplitude, I can figure out how many cycles to failure I'm going to have based on these relationships. Um, the what was I going to say? Uh, yeah. So, uh, for now, yeah. So, <coughs> these relationships generally hold. So, so first, first, they're these are empirically derived relationships. So, um, here on top of these points, there's generally some amount of scatter. Um, and that's due to the existing flaws that are inside of the material. So um, if you have, if you statistically have a flaw that's big enough, it's going to cause failure um, at different points along here. So these curves are approximate 
so this is very much an engineering approximation but the physics behind them is real and so that's what I'm going to talk about really briefly um, there are There are a couple relationships now. Uh, if we have different mean stresses and different stress amplitudes uh, and different types of cycles, there are different relationships to predict how this relationship will change. So um, specifically, there's there's a couple, I'm not gonna test you on this, but in case you're interested, there's a couple relationships. One uh, is the Goodman relationship uh, where if we have different stress mean stresses uh, mean stress it, it predicts how the how the stress amplitude to failure is going to change of the material uh, and then there's another one called the Palmer meter rule Palmer meter which uh, is actually somewhat practical but it basically says if I have different uh, fatigue cycles at different amplitudes and different mean stresses. So if I have some N1, N2, N3, <coughs> I can use, I can basically take the sum of all of those, uh, the sum of all of these, uh, these different stress amplitudes, uh, stre mean stresses and stress amplitudes, and figure out when this, when the sample is going to fail. So the the eventual failure of the sample is going to be the summative relationship of all of these different amplitudes, um, which for most engineering parts, you aren't just going to have one constant uh, stress being applied to it or one constant stress with one constant amplitude. Uh, you're going to have some variation. So if you can figure out what that variation is, you can use that to then predict what your failure is going to be. But um, I'm not going to talk about these much at all. They're uh, in the book if you're interested. Just wanted to throw out that there are ways that people have looked at, or things that people have looked at for these. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk about for fatigue is something called Paris's Law. Paris's. And so Paris, this was a law derived, uh, what, like the 1950s? Um, and this Paul Paris was actually a professor at Washington State University, or no, not Washington State, uh, WashU, so uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. So the other, the other Washington, because there's so many freaking Washington universities. Um, so uh, Paul Paris, this was the in the 1950s the first time people had actually thought about fatigue uh, in terms of how cracks grow in the material. So so he related it. To, um, to uh, mechanistically to crack growth. So basically we have um, some, so that, that stress intensity factor from fracture, K equals Ki sigma square root pi A. Um, so he took this fracture relationship and said, now um, if, if I think about not the stress that's being applied to a part, but the, the stress intensity that's being applied to a part. Um, I can take that stress intensity and find some relationship for the growth of a crack and the number of cycles to fit, or the, the growth of a crack based on the number of cycles. So the rate that a crack grows now, dA, dN, where this is, you remember we had some crack of size A, that crack gets stressed out, um, under some stress, and then it grows to some A plus delta A. So here, this is this is one cycle. I am growing my crack by some amount delta A. He actually quantified that, so saying the rate that each crack grows per cycle based on the the change in stress intensity. So now instead of the stress amplitude, we have the change in stress intensity, and he found that there was some almost exponential re relationship between these. So there's a couple different regions of this. Um, draw some bounds. Um, in region one, 
we have the, the stress intensity is too low for the crack to actually grow. So stress is too low for cracks to grow. So this is uh, related to the endurance limit. So um, here, if we if our stress amplitude is very low, our part doesn't fail at all. And that's because now mechanistically, the, the stress intensity is too low to actually cause the crack to grow. Um, inside this middle region, this is we have a region of constant crack growth where I have some exponent m and so this is this is the Paul Paris law or the Paris's law, where he says dA dN is actually related to the stress intensity to the m, where c is a constant, uh, and then the crack growth grows exponentially, exponentially, and so this region two we have region two we have Paris's law um, that applies. For the last one, for the highest stress one, region three, uh, or three, there we go. Uh, the stress intensity is just so high that it causes fracture directly. So we're directly causing fracture. Because so this is um, similar to our to our low cycle regime. So this. Um, low cycle plastic deformation. We're getting such high stresses that it's just gonna gonna crack when we start pulling on it. But um, so this this idea that cracks grow that crack growth is the cause of fatigue wasn't actually well understood until Paul Paris came along and, and came up with this explanation. And this I think has is, is still relatively well used today to, to explain mechanistically why why crack why fatigue happens, why crack growth and fatigue causes, why crack growth causes fatigue failure in materials. Um, cool. So I think that's all the time that I have because I'm going to hand out these evaluations. Um, tomorrow we'll go through a mid, uh, final uh, final review. So I'll talk about all the topics that will be on the mid, on the on the final. Um, I have office hours tomorrow. I'll try to post the solutions to those final practice problems sometime tonight. Yeah. Is that block E is zero in log log space? Uh, yes. Sorry, this would be log. Okay. Good catch. Uh, and I think uh, it, this is DADN is so this is a semi log scale. Um, we're just taking the log of K here. Okay, cool. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone.